That was a nice way to end nightly news. Thanks for being with us as we uh, begin the story. How are you? I'm Dan Haggerty. Let's try and start this night and this week off correctly. Thank you for being with us. Again, this is the story. And by the story, I kind of really mean your story. People seem to, I don't know, so far kind of like this little news experiment that we've been doing here. And while I certainly do a lot of talking. I don't really think that, that is why this show works. See, every day and night, it's your messages that steer the ship. They tell us kind of what's important to you, what's important to this city, what matters. So please keep that up. Keep telling us what matters. You can email us at the story at kgw.com. You can find me on Instagram, dan.haggerty on Instagram, or the story kgw, all one word. Also, Facebook works too, Dan Haggerty KGW. You can find me on there. But the fastest way every night to weigh in during the show specifically is on Twitter and use that hashtag. Hey, Dan. All right, let's get started. And let's get right to our big story tonight. The pandemic's impact on Oregon's prisons and a fight over whether or not to let some inmates leave prison to make it easier for the ones still inside to social distance. And this has been going on for months, right? You probably remember this conversation. First, Governor Kate Brown resisted letting any inmates walk free early. But on Friday, she kind of pivoted a little bit. And she said she considered letting some leave prison based on a list of criteria, things like their overall health, their age, their charges, of course, why they're in there in the first place. Based on all of that, the Department of Corrections says nearly 100 inmates qualify for possible release. But Maggie Vespa learned that members of the governor's own party are pushing back against her plan right now because they don't think 100 is a big enough number. They call it a decompression strategy, and they say, it's necessary because the inevitable has happened. You all know how dangerous COVID-19 is for those in our state prisons. Several lawmakers on Oregon's House and Senate Judiciary Committees joined today's Zoom call. They wanted to draw attention to their plan, which they sent to Governor Kate Brown last week. In it, they've ID'd three categories of inmates who they want released from Oregon's prisons. Total, it amounts to close to 2,000 people. Category A is made up of inmates who have served at least half their sentence and have a severe medical condition. Category B were scheduled to be released within four months and they have to have a plan for where they'll live. Category C were scheduled to be released within six months and may not have housing lined up now, but once they do, their release would be approved. All inmates ID'd in this proposal also have been convicted of non-violent crimes and they can't be released until their county has reopened. Lawmakers were clear each release would be decided on a case-by-case -case basis, and victims would be notified in advance. We do not expect to see uh, a significant number, quote-unquote, walking out the door uh, uh, immediately, meaning in the next 24, 30, uh, 72 hours. Uh, this will take some time. For and speaking of, timing is key. This group sent Governor Kate Brown the plan last week, and she then sent her version to the DOC. The department telling reporters under the governor's plan, 100 inmates of Oregon's roughly 15,000 would be released. That said, both plans come in the wake of spikes in infection rates in Oregon's prisons. At one point, the Oregon State Penitentiary was deemed the state's largest outbreak, with more than 160 inmates infected, along with with dozens of staff. One inmate has died of the virus. In recent weeks, advocacy groups sued, demanding the state release close to half its prison population. They also demanded the state ramp up testing, something Representative Janelle Bynum touched on today, pointing out prisons are largely filled with people of color. It's OHA has issued um, guidance for um, people of color to be able to have unfettered access to testing. So I wanted to make sure that that was available um, in the facilities as well. It does not seem to be. The testing issue aside, there is pushback on letting any inmates walk free. The District Attorney's Association wrote the plan undermines truth in sentencing and discounts the safety and security of victims. We had one victim reach out to us back in April. Is Her name so is Trinity Landry. She's 18 and said she was abused for years. Landry says her abuser, Jerry Rice, is older, medically vulnerable, and in prison after pleading down to lesser nonviolent charges. She pleaded with the governor not to let him go free. So every single day he's in there means everything to me because that is what I fought for and it's my justice. 
Tonight, and months later, Landry right. wasn't available for an interview, but said she doesn't know if Rice will be let out early. Her opinion on the situation hasn't changed. That said, per the governor's office, it will be at least a week before any decisions are made. Maggie Vespa, KGW News. You know, as we, we talk about timing and how interesting timing is through all of this, it is truly wild, really, how the stars have aligned for Portland to step on a path toward police reform. I mean, think about this first. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, contract negotiations between the city and the Portland Police Association, the union, those halted. Had they gone forward, that contract would have been locked in before these renewed conversations about police brutality even restarted. So activists see a real opportunity there, but they might also see an opportunity in this guy. That's Multnomah County District Attorney-elect Mike Schmidt. He won by a landslide in last month's election, running as the reform candidate, and he'll be taking over for longtime Multnomah County DA Rod Underhill. So we interviewed Schmidt before the election to hear all about his plan, what he wanted to do. But obviously, a lot has changed since then. So I sat down with him again to see just what kind of reform he wants to see. All right, newly elected district attorney Mike Schmidt, thank you so much for joining us and taking taking the time. How can you reflect on the past, you know, 10 or 12 days, not considering you getting the newly elected position, but just the country and the city and the county and the state in general? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, my probably like so many, uh, it's been really hard to, um, you know, you start with watching the video as I did, uh, and it was horrific uh, to see how George Floyd was killed. And we knew it wasn't right. And so I immediately, like so many others, you know, went out into the community, and, um, you know, listening to some of our leaders in the community, how they're dealing with it. And I went from frustration, anger, we've done this before, this keeps happening, how do we change this? To where I'm now, um, you know, starting to get a little bit more hopeful um, that this feels different than previous times we've done this, that, that now is a time where people are really willing and listening and, and ready to make some changes. Do you have any examples of some of the things you think might have been more difficult to get done before that you feel like you have an easier path to doing now? Yeah, you know, I think I've heard a lot of conversations around um, cash bail. Uh, and we know in Multnomah County, when you look at who is being held in our jail uh, before their trial, we see a lot of disparity. I believe the number was somewhere around 29% of people held in jail pretrial in Multnomah County, uh, pre-COVID, before we really decreased our jail population, uh, were black. Uh, and, you know, that's obviously with about 6% of the population in the county, that's wildly disparate. Um, you know, I think issues like that, people are now saying, people of, of all walks are saying, you know what, that isn't right. We should be like, taking a look at that. Mm -hmm. uh, and if money is the reason that we're holding people and not because they're a danger to the public or not because they never show up, you know, we ought to get that. And hopefully that can drive down disparity. So cash bail, uh, sentencing reform, uh, same thing. You know, I mean, we've talked a lot about mass incarceration. Uh, and how, how we're using our resources, how many people are incarcerated at the state level. And I think now we're having a conversation in our community about do the budget priorities that we've established in the state and in locally, do they really reflect our community values? Or should we be changing where some of those budgets are being allocated? And I think mass incarceration is one of those things that people are going to be more willing to say, you know what? Instead of investing in prisons and holding people and not really treating them or working with them, let's invest in schools and, and community that has been impacted by crime, by, you know, not having opportunity. There's also an argument that once people are incarcerated, that it is nearly impossible for them to restart their life, that they always wear that with them as they try to continue, even if they uh, have overall goals to become productive citizens. Uh, is, there a, is there a thought when it comes to that as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I mean, we, we see examples of people who do make it and they do change their lives. But really, a lot of times they're the exception to the rule. Uh, our statewide recidivism rates for people leaving prison is 50 to 60 percent. And recidivism means they are arrested for a new crime within three years of leaving prison. So it's not working. Uh, and that's because when we send you to prison, you're not getting treatment. You're not dealing with whatever the underlying issues you were uh, that, that got you in there in the first place. You're not fixing those things. And in fact, you're meeting some new friends and some un making unhealthy relationships. 
Uh, and then, as you point out, you re-enter the community, and now you have a felony on your record, at least. You have a gap in your job resume because you've been out of our community for a period of time. You probably didn't receive the job training or the underlying issue training that you needed to deal with those things. Uh, and so, yeah, we are setting people up for failure, and it really does become a situation where it's very hard uh, to get yourself out of that cycle. And I do think it's the exception to the rule of people that are able to succeed in spite of our system and, and sometimes not because of. So we talked for a while longer, as you, you would imagine. Usually when we show you interviews like that, you can find a lot more online. And this, this is exactly the same way. You can uh, hear more of what he has to say, especially you heard him mention cash bail, right? I asked him if he supports ending cash bail entirely. Um, it's a big answer. It's one that I think you should learn about, try to consider yourself. You can find our full conversation right now on the KGW YouTube channel. Please check it out. And while you're there, hit that subscribe button and check out all the other stuff we're doing. So the Portland Police Bureau is on a bit of a charm defensive right now because people like me, all the journalists in town, across the country really, have been staring at their tactics, putting them under a microscope over the last few weeks. I mean, one of the main reasons that thousands of people are protesting every single night is to demand changes that prevent police brutality, specifically against black men who bear the brunt of it. But as of recently, journalists across the country and right here in Portland seem to be bearing some of it as well. On Saturday, for instance, Zane Sparling from the Portland Tribune, Tribune tweeted a video and a quick story about getting caught up in some PPB crowd control. He says that he yelled that he was with the media, but he says police didn't care, that they shoved him into a wall and shot him with some kind of crowd control munition. Then last night, Beth Nakamura with the Oregonian tweeted, an officer hit her from behind with a baton and shoved her even after she held up her media credentials and her camera. Now, those stories spread pretty quickly, and Portland police put out a response, a video, and their message basically distilled down to this. If they call a civil disturbance, they don't care who you're with. When a civil disturbance, unlawful assembly, or riot are declared, it's because criminal activity is occurring and that the area is not safe for anyone. These declarations are made verbally multiple times over the soundtracks. The same warnings are posted online on our Twitter account. We provide ample time to leave the area before dispersal begins. So when it comes to uh, relaying information, sometimes the role of the media and the role of the police get muddled, especially in today's age where they have, you know, uh, the ability to put out videos like the one you just saw. Typically, look, they send us press releases about crimes, but we investigate all that stuff as journalists. We interview them to get information, but we want to make it perfectly clear, and hopefully, I don't even have to say this, but we don't work for them, right? And, and right now, they are the story, or at least a really big part of the story, and I think you deserve to see what happens downtown, even after police declare a civil disturbance. So, we will continue to show you. All right, tonight's quote of the day comes to us from a United States Supreme Court justice writing in a monumental decision today that, quote, it is impossible to discriminate against a person for being homosexual or transgender without discriminating against that individual based on sex. It was not Ruth Bader Ginsburg, not Stephen Breyer, or any of the other justices appointed by a Democratic president. No, it was Justice Neil Gorsuch, President Trump's first appointee. He joined Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, Kagan, and Chief Justice Roberts today in affirming that LGBTQ Americans are protected under Title VII protections against workplace discrimination. In other words, you can no longer be fired for being gay or for being transgender, something that Oregon law has affirmed since 2008 and in Washington since 2006. Now, the three justices who dissented from this, they wrote for different reasons. They wrote two different reasons for their dissent. Justice Samuel Alito basically argued that the court doesn't exist to update old laws to reflect current values, while Justice Brett Kavanaugh wrote his own dissent, arguing that while he agrees with the ruling, but he doesn't think it's the court's job to make it. He thinks Congress should have passed a law amending Title VII. So for all intents and purposes, nothing really has changed for the people here in Oregon or in Washington, but in the other 26 states where it was not illegal to fire someone based on their sexual orientation or gender or identity, tomorrow is a new day. When the story continues. Obviously, it isn't uh, good, but what exactly does it mean to be 49th in COVID-19 testing like Oregon is? And the reckoning over statues and street names. It's Portland and strippers for social justice. It's the latest installment of news about vices. It's, well, it's vice news.
we're back. Welcome back to the story. This is the show that rewards you, you could say, for watching while uh, also scrolling on your phone while you watch. So as you're scrolling, include that hashtag Hey Dan on Twitter. It's kind of the fastest way to see what people are talking about when they're discussing the show real time, and it's the best and fastest and easiest way to talk to us whenever you want. So you can also email us, though. Don't forget at the story at kgw.com. But whichever way you reach out, we'll we'll find your message. All right, let's talk about what we got on Twitter. Actually, this is a post from viewer Gene Howard. Gene says, Hey Dan. Oregon has now made a notable achievement. I'm picking up some sarcasm. We've gone down to number 49 of 50 states for testing. Can you explain? I'd love to, Gene. Thank you. Uh, but to be honest, that's pretty much um, what there is to know, to be honest with you. Oregon is second to last in testing behind Idaho. We mentioned that on Friday, but we didn't go into much more detail. So let's do that right now. Let's take a look at the numbers. Now, the numbers come from Johns Hopkins University, and they are per capita. So Oregon is 49th in testing. Now, we have tested about 170,000, 175,000 people total, but the way that breaks down is uh, 3,966 tests per 100,000 people. Washington is in 30 third place with 5,837 tests per 100,000 people. And again, Idaho is in last place. They've tested 3,572 per 100,000. Rhode Island is in the lead by a really wide margin. They've tested 18,114 people per 100,000. But it's a lot easier to get a test right now than it was a few months ago. In some cases, you don't even have to have symptoms or know someone with the virus. Health leaders really hope that these new guidelines will close the racial gap in COVID-19 cases. That's because the virus is infecting and killing a disproportionate amount of people, frankly, who aren't white here in Oregon and in ac uh, across the country. That's why, as of a few weeks ago, Oregonians who are black, Latinx, Native American, Asian, or Pacific Islander can get a test, no questions asked. Also, people with disabilities or whose first language was not English. Others who can get tests, uh, migrant, uh, uh, migrant or seasonal farm workers entering the state, people exposed in group settings, so places like nursing homes or prisons, like we discussed earlier, and anybody in close contact with a person who has a confirmed or presumed case of COVID-19. But look, no matter who you are, seek out a test. Please, though, they always say call first before you go somewhere, just in case you might be sick. You don't want to infect other people, of course. So here on the story, we're not really afraid to talk about some of the more taboo things in our society, you know, sex and drugs and rock and roll, all that stuff, which means it's time for another edition of Vice News. First up, Portland stripper strike for social justice. Hundreds of strippers, dancers, performers, and fans are posting on Instagram and elsewhere demanding fair working conditions for black strippers in Portland. But part of their message is also defunding the Portland police with this message. The clubs don't open until we say so. Commit to defunding the PPD, PPB or no butts on stage in Portland, Oregon. How about that? All right, now, next vice. One of Oregon's favorite topics, marijuana. Sales have been skyrocketing while everyone's, you know, cooped up at home finding things to do like baking banana bread, smoking pot, and then eating all of your banana bread. And we've got new numbers to back that all up. In May, statewide marijuana sales grew to more than $100 million, which is the first time that has happened in a single month. That's up 60% from last year. Not sure about banana sales. We're still looking for the numbers. And that's Vice News. Now, the current movement here for racial equality reminds us once and again how many confederate monuments this country has uh, these aren't really new conversations right we've been fighting over whether to keep these statues or take them down of confederate soldiers and generals and leaders longer really than the confederacy was around to begin with but now we've seen stuff like this nascar has banned the confederate flag democrats they want uh, confederate statues removed from the u.s capitol and scrubbed off of the names of our military bases, places like Fort Bragg and Fort Hood. The conversations around these statues usually devolve to two clear sides. We shouldn't be exalting people who fought to preserve slavery or, yes, slavery was awful, but we shouldn't erase our history. But now there's a third option. Skip the conversation altogether and just tear down the statues. That's what happened last night in North Portland at Jefferson High School. About five protesters hung around after a large protest and tore down the statue of America's third president and prominent slave owner. Hence the word slave owner tagged on the pedestal there. Now, at the same time, there is a change.org petition to change the name of North Calhoun Avenue in the St. John's neighborhood. 
The petitioner says that it's named after John C. Calhoun, was the seventh president, uh, the seventh vice president, rather, and he was one of the biggest defenders of slavery in American history. The petitioners want to rename the avenue De Priest Avenue after James De Priest. It's only four, four blocks, so it's not a big expense for the city. And to, to, you know, I think our one concern is that um, De Priest probably deserves a much bigger street. You're wondering, who's James DePriest, Dan? Who is this guy? Well, if you don't know, he was the music director and conductor of the Oregon Symphony for more than 20 years. The petition is uh, less than 2,000 signatures away right now from its goal of 5,000. Since these most recent protests over racism and police brutality started, we've been taking a look at Oregon's racist roots and the impacts that that has on today and what life is like now. Like redlining in Portland, for instance. Banks would deny mortgages to people of color, creating segregated neighborhoods. The majority of black Portlanders were confined to the Albina district. You see it there in Northeast. In 1967, KGW aired a documentary focusing on that neighborhood and how it was overlooked and marginalized by the city. That was right in the thick of the civil rights movement, when people were protesting and rallying right here in Portland, much like we're seeing today. In the summer of 1967, protesters faced off with police in Irving Park in what became known as the Albina Riot of 1967. Dozens were arrested. There were thousands of dollars worth of property damage. And we want to open the KGW vault and play part of that Albina documentary for you now. It shows what Portland's black community was demanding more than 50 years ago, things that are still relevant today, 50 years later. Now remember, this is 1967, so you're going to hear some outdated language. Portland has missed the message. They've dismissed it as outside agitators or, or a couple of hoodlums uh, doing something bad. But it's real. It really is. And I feel that unless the white people of the community realize this, realize that things are not as good as they thought they were unless they come and see the roaches, the rats, the garbage, the dope addicts, that this is going to happen again and again until something good is done about it. Lots of times the white man says the Negro has to pull himself up by his own bootstraps. What's your answer to this? That's true, and you see it happening now in this black awareness, but we cannot do it alone. We can't do it alone. We didn't make the problem by ourselves. And he could thwart, a, thwart it off by saying, well, it's not my responsibility. Those people don't want to work. They don't want to do this. But that's how he rationalizes the problem. But it's his responsibility, too. He's the one that, in reality, he's the one that has the job. He's got the money. But we want some. So look, we're going to be showing you uh, different parts of that documentary throughout the week. We've had a lot of people show interest in that, so we're going to keep showing it. But we get a lot of interest in the vault all the time, you know, with KGW's history here in Portland. So if you have an idea, if you want us to dig around in there and see if we can find something for you, let us know. Email us, of course, or you can use that hashtag, HeyDan, on Twitter. Speaking of that, we're going to read some comments after the break, maybe even answer a few questions. So get out your phone, use that hashtag, HeyDan, email us at thestorykgw.com. We're going to finish the story when we come back. I'm getting some funny comments tonight. Randy Keppel right in and said, anyone else get nervous when Dan starts talking slowly? Sometimes I like to take, you know, I get a lot of feedback saying I speak too quickly, so I try to slow things down a little bit. I don't want to make you anxious when I do it. I'll start talking fast again, don't worry. Uh, we're also, uh, so somebody said, so Oregon is near the bottom of the list for testing. This is coming from JJ Curtis on Twitter. So how come the Blazers are going to get tests for each, players every, uh, each player every day? Meanwhile, the rest of Oregon is have a tough time. I don't know. Good question. Maybe I'll ask. I'm sure it has something to do with privately purchasing tests as opposed to getting them free, as all Americans and all people in Oregon should be able to get right now. But uh, that's a good question. I'll ask. We've also had some people writing in and asking us about the Albina documentary, which is just uh, really fantastic, and it's a, it's a great way to look back uh, to the 60s. And, and think about some of the same conversations we're still having today and why those conversations need to be over and why we need to start really having solutions in today's society. But if you want to watch the whole thing, it is on the KGW YouTube channel. So you can watch that, again, from like 1967. It's an hour long. Then there was another 30-minute documentary, I think, that aired sometime in the mid-'80s. So, you know, look into our history. Take a look. Learn it. And that's the best way to build moving forward from today. Thank you for being with us. That is the story for tonight. The news at 6.30 is next. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Thanks for starting your week with us.